who am I? Who am I that I should be invited to come and preach here in this wonderful place? To preach on my favorite topic, Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior of my life, the one who has ransomed me. You know, I was not born on this continent. I was born in the land of Portugal, but when I was five years old, my parents decided to immigrate to Canada because, like Jean Valjean, they wanted to start a new life. And we arrived in Canada, and I soon discovered that people who are new and look a little bit different were not always welcome. And I'll never forget that day when I came out of my kindergarten class, and I was pinned up against a wall by three other bigger boys in the older grades. The proverbial bully got me, pinned me against the wall, and were ready to punch me out when all of a sudden I looked and I saw coming up the road a yellow Mustang convertible. Yellow, you say. Yes, I'm not as young as I look. And who pulls up and swings open the door but my father. And just as I was ready to do something in my pants that I didn't want to do, all of a sudden, as soon as I saw my father's face, I picked up courage and I said, I turned around and walked towards the car and just as I was getting into the car, I looked back at those bullies and I said to them, you're lucky my dad showed up because if he didn't next time, I'm going to punch your lights out. That's how you deal with bullies, right? Let us pray. Our Lord, our Savior, I thank you, my God, for this day. And I thank you, Father, for this occasion in which we can focus on you and how you deal with sin in this world. Father in heaven, Help us to understand your character. Help us today to fall in love with you. Shine, dear Father. Shine this very day. Who am I, Lord, that I should have the privilege of standing here and to speak about you? Lord God, I just surrender my life. You have saved me from so much. I give you my all, dear Father. And I ask you to shine through me today and to shine into all of our hearts and transform us, and ransom us, and set us free with your love. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. You know that skit, which was so beautifully performed for us here this morning, in that nighttime conversation, I was reminded of another nighttime conversation that took place a long, long time ago. And I'm going to invite you to go into your Bibles at this point to John chapter 3. And we'll pick up the story right there in verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This must have taken Nicodemus aback a little bit, because here he is coming with some praise for Jesus. You know, as human beings, we all love praise, don't we? We all love to be told how good we are and how wonderful we are, how smart we are. But Jesus wasn't going to buy that at all. Jesus did not come into this world to be praised. Not at first, anyway. Jesus came into this world to let go of self. And so Nicodemus must have been very surprised that Jesus immediately cut to the quick and said, 
I am telling you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, I can imagine, must have coughed a little bit and <laughs> uh, laughed, a nervous laugh, and said, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter again into his mother's womb? <laughs> Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I have said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And now, if you jump down with me, he, he goes on and he says, in verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Curious, isn't it? Just as Moses lifted up the serpent, Many of us will remember this story. It's found in Numbers chapter 21, in verses 4 to 9. And there, in that passage, we read that the people of Israel were grumbling. Again, they were grumbling. And so, it's interesting that God took a great risk at that point. A great risk in being misunderstood, because what God did is he sent Fiery serpents, the scripture says. Poisonous serpents. To go and bite the people. And as the people were dying from the snake bites, he instructed Moses to make a serpent out of bronze. And he told everybody, put that serpent on a pole. Lift it up high so that everybody can see. And everyone was told by Moses, look here. Look here. And you will find healing for your wounds. Look here indeed. Why would God do something like that? Why would God risk leading his people into idolatry? You say, what are you talking about leading his people into idolatry? You know, folks, if you go to the story and you look in 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 4, the story. When I say the story, I'm talking about the Old Testament. I'm talking about the New Testament. The Word of God, the Scripture is the story. It is the story, the drama that really matters. And it is not a work of fiction like Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. In the story, we find in 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 4 that the nation of Israel had actually preserved that bronze serpent and they were worshipping it right in the days of the kings. God indeed took a great risk. What was he doing? Why on earth would he take a serpent? Why would he send the serpents in the first place to bite the people's heels? What was it all about? Well, we know that throughout the scripture, serpents are consistent symbols of evil of that which is wrong. We find the first serpent right there at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3. We read that the, the serpent was more cunning, more sophisticated, more crafty than any other beast that the Lord God had made. Only because it had been possessed by God's enemy, Satan. And he came to, Adam and, uh, to Eve first, and then to Adam, and he said to Eve, did God really say that you cannot eat of every tree of the garden? We can eat from every tree of the garden, Eve said. But this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God has said, you will not eat it or touch it, she said, lest you die. And of course, God had never said you cannot touch it. The serpent turns around and says, God is lying to you. Well, that, those weren't the exact words, but that's what he meant. You will not surely die, said the serpent. No way. He's lying to you. In other words, you cannot trust your God. 
He's trying to withhold something from you. And let me tell you what it is, Eve. He's got the wool pulled over your eyes because he knows full well that if you eat this fruit, the, the wool will be pulled back. Your eyes will be opened and you will know the difference between good and evil for yourself. In other words, Eve, listen carefully to my brilliant talk. In other words, Eve, you can become your own God. And folks, this is not new because this is the temptation that arose in his own heart. We read in Isaiah chapter 14 that he stood up one day and he said, why can't I be God? In fact, I demand to be God. I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. I will sit on the mountain of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will be like the most high God. And so, folks, what actually happened there in the Garden of Eden is that what Satan did is he took that virus that messed up his thinking, that messed up the programming, the perfect programming that God had put into his brain. And he took it and he transmitted it, delivered it into the hearts and minds of Adam and Eve. And ever since that day, Human beings who walk upon the face of the earth are hacked with a virus that they cannot do anything about. A virus which compels us to look after number one first. Take care of your first. Take care of yourself first, they say. Pay yourself first, they say. Have you ever had an investor come to your home? telling you about how to invest your money. And what do they tell you? Pay yourself first. Look after number one. Now, there's nothing wrong with investing your money or anything like that. But there is something wrong with the mindset that says, me first, me, myself, and I. I would say that this virus that the devil has implanted into the human mind, into the human operating system, can we call it meitis? Because that's exactly what it is. It is nothing short of meitis. And it was transmitted into the hearts and minds of human beings. So, I'm still confused. Why is it then that God would use a serpent and put it up on a pole, the symbol of evil, the source of meitis? Why would he say to the people in ancient Israel, look here, look here and be healed? And more curious yet, why would Jesus say that when he is lifted up, it will be like lifting up a serpent way up high for people to see and to be healed? What's it all about? Well, we have a clue. And if you don't mind, come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And in 2 Corinthians 5, we are told what happened when Jesus Christ went to that cross. Verse 21 Paul says to us, For he, that is God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, when Jesus Christ went up onto that cross, he was, there on that cross, the personification of sin. And people were supposed to look at that cross and they were supposed to get a message just like the people of ancient Israel were supposed to get a message by looking at the bronze serpent. What would that message be? That message is, look folks, all of your grumbling, all of your griping, all of your complaining, they are just symptoms, they are outputs of a system that has been hacked by the virus called meitis. You are so concerned with yourself. You are so concerned with your survival. You are so concerned with your own comfort. I want you to look at this. I want you to look here, and I want you to see just how ugly it really is. And when Jesus Christ was lifted up high on the cross, the purpose was for God to be able to show all of humanity and the angels of heaven for in, first, uh, excuse me, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, we are told that it pleased the Father to lift up Jesus Christ on that cross. And in this way, he made peace on earth and in heaven. For as we heard yesterday, 
And as we know well as Seventh-day Adventists, the problem of sin predates this earth. The problem of sin arose in the heavenly courts. And there was war in heaven. And that war in heaven did not get resolved until Jesus Christ was plastered there upon that cross. And the purpose was for us to be able to see just how awful, just how evil the sin problem really is. Jesus became sin on that cross. He took upon himself our own sinfulness. He carried throughout his life, because he was born as a human being, he carried meitis in himself. The only difference is that Jesus Christ was able to quarantine that virus. And it never affected his output. We read in Hebrews chapter 4 that Jesus Christ was tempted in every way just like we are. And yet, he was without sin. Oh, my brothers and sisters. Meitis. The sin problem. The virus of selfishness, of self-centeredness, had to be vanquished. It had to be conquered. It had to be neutralized. As long as Jesus Christ was here on this earth, it was quarantined in himself. The first human being to ever find it possible to quarantine that meitis and never affect the output. But it wasn't enough. He had to go. He had to go to the cross. He had to die because he had to kill that virus. In everything in his life, Jesus Christ always overcame that selfishness problem. Do you remember when, early on in his ministry, when he was starving for 40 days, the devil found him there. And he came to him and he said, if you really are the son of God, I don't believe it. Because you know what? I don't think that God would ever let his son starve. If you really are the son of God, why don't you prove it to me and turn these stones into bread? Now, you see, folks, this is a, this is a tremendous temptation for God because that's who he was. He was God and yet he was fully human at the same time. Now, for me, this is not a temptation. I have never been tempted to turn stones into bread. There has been a time when I turned bread into a stone, yes. But to turn stones into bread, that's a different story. But God, he could do it. And he could save himself from, from hunger. He could bring about some comfort for himself. And yet he refused to do that. At every point in his life, Jesus Christ refused to give in to the temptation that says, pay yourself first. Look after yourself first. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the bullies came. And Jesus was prepared for them. And unlike in my story, where I had a dad coming by in his chariot, his yellow car, to save me and rescue me, so that I could just turn around and say, next time you come, I'm going to punch your lights out. No. In the Garden of Gethsemane, there was no father there to come to his rescue. The Lord God let Jesus go just like he lets me and you go whenever we choose to vent our meitis. He lets us do it. You ever notice that? He just lets us do it. And he lets us face the consequences. In fact, he wants us to see the consequences. In fact, the story, the Bible, is full of one story after another, after another, after another, where God says, look here. Look at how awful this sin problem is. Look at what this meitis is doing to my children. Look how awful it is. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus Christ. You see, as they came to arrest Jesus, Jesus stood up and he faced his bullies and he looked them square in the eye and he said, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus stood up and he said, I am. Now, I know that your Bible says, I am he, but if you have a King James Version, you'll notice that the word he is in italics, which means it is not there in the original language. It's not there in the Greek. In other words, when Jesus Christ stood up and he said, I am, he just declared himself to be none other than the living God of the universe. 
And as he said those words, we read the story in John chapter 18 that all of those men, the bullies who came to arrest him, fell backwards as though they were dead. And the disciples were emboldened by this. And Peter picked up his sword and he went off and he cut off Malchus's ear. Jesus stopped him right there in his tracks and he said, Peter, he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. I am not here to promote violence. I am the living God of the universe, but I am not a violent God. Violence is a product of sin. Violence is a product of meitis. It is an evil output which I have come to destroy. I refuse to use violence and I refuse to save myself in this way. Even though I can. I could just call my father right now. I could dial him up 911 and I could say send 10 legions of angels. 10,000 of them and I could destroy this world and go home to my father and be set free. But no, I love you too much for that. I have come into this world to take your place. To die for you on that cross. To be that serpent. To be sin. Lifted high. And I'm going to kill the sin problem. I am going to destroy sin in the flesh. And this is what Paul tells us Jesus did in Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. He condemned sin in the flesh. You see, when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he demonstrated several things. First of all, he demonstrated just how awful sin is. That is why he had to be that serpent lifted up high. So that everybody could see, so that even the angels of heaven could see. And at the same time, he demonstrated God's character and how wonderful it is. Because even though he was God and he could save himself, he did not save himself. And finally, he condemned that sinfulness by refusing to save himself, by refusing to look after himself first. Therefore, according to Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 and 9, he is the author of salvation. Let me translate it into 21st century talk. He is the author of the antivirus software for the human mind. For we have been hacked by a virus which says, me, 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 me. But Jesus Christ said, you, 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 you. And in this way, there upon the cross of Calvary and in his whole life, Jesus Christ literally created a program that will neutralize meitis in the human mind. By his obedience, he was able to save us. By his obedience, Romans chapter 5, verse 19, he made many righteous. How did he do that? Come with me to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18 tells us that in himself he suffered and he was tempted. But because he suffered in this way, because he was tempted, because he felt the virus and overcame it, he is able, therefore, to aid those who are tempted. He is able to aid us. In other words, according to the book of Hebrews, he is our intercessor. Let me translate that into 21st century language. He is the technical support guy that we can come to at any time to receive grace in time of need. Hebrews chapter 4. Any time. We can call technical support and we can say, I want to refresh my screen. I want to click the I accept button and I want to receive the download of the antivirus software from my mind to cleanse me and to renew me. What does that down download look like? Come with me to John chapter 14. That download is none other than the presence of Jesus Christ himself in our lives. John chapter 14. It is the presence of Jesus Christ in the form of his Holy Spirit. Listen carefully to this. Verse 15 of, of chapter 14. If you love me, he says, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you a helper, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, says Jesus Christ. I will come to you. In other words, what happened in the life of Jesus Christ is that he found in himself the formula to conquer sin problem in the flesh. And therefore, 
Because he has gone before us. Because he has gone ahead, according to the book of Hebrews. He is now able to aid us. But only if we choose. Only if we come to believe just how good our God really is. Only if we come to believe and, and understand just how awful our sin problem is. Only when we reject that sin problem and say, I don't want to have any more part of it. I don't want to have any more of this negative output. I don't want to be fighting with my wife anymore. I don't want to be beating up my children anymore. I want to know the mind of Jesus Christ. And there is a formula, and that formula is to receive Jesus Christ himself. Because apart from me, he says in John 15, you can do nothing. We are not able to conquer this meitis on our own. But he who conquered it for us said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And if he overcame the world, he is now our heavenly high priest. He is now our technical support staff upon whom we can call at any time in any place. This is what Jesus meant when he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. This is what it means to refresh your screen. This is what it means to be baptized with water. This is why the Holy Spirit throughout the scripture is compared to rain falling upon our hearts. Because what God wants to do is he wants to refresh our screens. God wants to take that sin problem that is within us and he wants to vanquish it. And he came upon this earth and he did just that in my place and in your place. This is the sense in which Jesus Christ is our substitute. Not because he had to appease God in some way. Not because God demanded some kind of punishment. Oh, you must die for this sin, and so I will kill somebody else in your place. That's not even ethical. What society on the face of this earth actually accepts that one person should die in the place of another? Are we more righteous than God? No, the death of Jesus on the cross was not to appease God. No, 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 says Mrs. White in Steps to Christ. No. He came into this world to show us how awful the sin problem is. He came into this world to conquer it, destroy it. And he came into this world to show us the way to download his life into our lives. This is what happened when he ransomed our souls. He set us free from that virus. This is what happened in this skit when the priest delivered Jean Valjean from another 10 or 20 years in prison. He ransomed him, he said, and now your life belongs to God. You say, oh, that's beautiful. I wish I could believe it. Les Miserables is a story. It's a, it's a fictional story. Victor Hugo made it up, you know, a cunningly devised fable. It's wonderful. But does this really happen in real life? You better believe it. Let me tell you the story of a widow's might. This story was first related to us in 1998 by Carl Wilkins and Eric Gutschus. I hope I pronounced that right. They were ADRA workers in the nation of Rwanda. You know, Rwanda. That place where such a horrible tragedy occurred within our own lifetimes. Nearly one million people murdered to death. Hacked, in fact. The murderers could actually look at their victims in the eye. And as they were driving through Rwanda one day, four years after those massacres, they picked up a hitchhiker. They asked her questions because... They looked at her and she had a terrible scar upon her face. And they said to her, how did this happen? And she began to tell the story of how one of those murderers came and hacked her husband to death right before her very eyes and then went after her and left her for dead. One day, several years later, as she was walking into the market, she came face to face with the man who murdered her husband. And the man who nearly murdered her. Now, the meitis within us says, turn him in. Turn him into the authorities now. This man must pay. And the man knew because he recognized her too. He was shocked. He thought he had killed her. 
And he was there in the crowded marketplace, and there was no place to run. He couldn't get away quickly, and he began to sweat profusely. He began to get so nervous, so much so that everybody noticed, and they began to ask the woman, why is it that this man is shaking this way? What, what, what's going on? And she looked at him, and he looked at her. And just like in our skit, she turned to the people, and she said, this man visited me upon my death. He thought for sure that I was dead, that I would die. He's trembling because he thinks he sees a ghost. Wow. It didn't stop there. The man had sweat so profusely that his shirt was just drenched. She brought him home. She went into the closet and she took out one of her son's shirts and she said, here, take this shirt so that you may be presentable in public. I don't know how many other people you killed. I don't know if anybody else will accuse you. But as for me, I forgive you. I forgive you. Wow. Where did this lady find it within herself to do that? Where does the priest in this fictional story find it within himself to say, not only do I set you free, but I'm going to give you the most expensive silver in my house. And in the story of Jean Valjean, we read that Jean Valjean's life is literally transformed. And he himself becomes an agent of Jesus Christ. To advertise the antivirus software that can set us free from the meitis that binds us and all of the pain and sorrow that come with it. I invite you to look at Jesus Christ hanging upon that cross. I invite you to look at the sin problem and see how ugly and how evil it is. I invite you to look and see them wagging their heads at him and saying, if you really are the Son of God, why don't you come down from that cross and save us? I invite you to look at Jesus Christ saying, no, I will not come down from this cross because I will not defend, I will not save myself. I have come to save this world. And I will conquer this sin problem right here upon this cross in the flesh. I invite you to look at Jesus Christ and I invite you to refresh your screen. I invite you to click the I accept button and to receive the download that he has for us, to receive the Holy Spirit, to receive the outpouring of God's grace so that we may indeed be set free. And when I am set free, that I can be a conduit to set somebody else free. This is why Jesus Christ has come into this world. Jesus Christ came to ransom our souls. Just like the priest ransomed the soul of Jean Valjean. Just like Jesus ransomed the soul of this widow and gave her a might far more powerful than any hatred, far more powerful than any sword. The might, the widow's might, which transforms a human life. I want to invite you to accept Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to refresh your screen and to click the I accept button and to receive the download of the Holy Spirit to be set free this very day. How many of us here would like to say, I accept? Put your mouse in your hand. Click it now. I accept. I accept. And now that you accept, I would like to invite you to be that conduit. For he has called each one to reach one. Each one of us has the great privilege of being the great advertiser. Of being that source, that funnel through which the grace of God is spread to the entire world. For Jesus Christ did not come into this world to condemn it, but to save it. That whosoever believes 
should not perish, but have everlasting life.